All right, uh, the Dow right now down about 170 points. A lot of this on the back and forth, what's going on uh, out of Canada right now. We're uh, hearing uh, that Canada is just notifying folks that a Canadian citizen has been detained in China. You might remember that Canada had arrested the CFO of uh, Weiwei uh, on these allegations that uh, she was gathering intelligence, spying. Uh, uh, on, on people, and of course, they wanted to have her arrested. Uh, they did. Uh, and then there was a bail hearing today, the Chinese responding by arresting a Canadian citizen. The Chinese have also uh, taken and talked to ambassadors from Canada in China and our ambassador to China. Uh, but this appears to be escalating. That's the only thing I can see that would suddenly add to sort of the volatility here. Uh, which one way or the other uh, works to my next guest's advantage, because in a world that's volatile and you want to protect yourself from it, the CBOE is the place to go. He's the chairman and CEO of that August institution at Tilly. Um, and Ed, I was just saying, I mean, most people are familiar when they talk about the CBOE with one of your most vaulted indexes, the fear index, the volatility index, the VIX. And that's been all over the map, but that sort of speaks to what's going on in the world. It does indeed, and, and the change in the level of volatility and really looking at volatility over time is very telling and really should inform your viewers on the market's perception over time. Very, very important point. So when you have a lot of developments today, obviously the White House impasse, the Google CEO leaving Capitol Hill today, people try to protect themselves from wild swings, right, up or down, uh, and your exchange addresses those. But is it is it more frenetic on a day like this? Uh, I don't think a day like this has been more typical since September than, uh, than, than normal. If we look at a year ago, we had you know, a couple spikes here and there in the market, and they were really led by unknowns in the marketplace, complete unknowns. We now have things that are potentially going to move the market for an extended period of time, whether it's uh, uh, China trade talks, uh, the ebb and flow of the, the progress there, uh, whether it's Brexit, the vote on, on vote, off vote, the, the likelihood of passing uh, something that's reasonable, all of those... That's in the eye of the beholder, obviously. It, but what it is yeah. is still uncertain. And yeah. the market's uh, perception of risk over time is more uncertain than it has been. And we look at that, as I say, there is an average level of volatility in the marketplace what traders are pricing in insurance for a portfolio of the S&P 500, there's an average there. We are way above that average, and it's a sustained high level over time. Very unusual for the market. So I'm, I'm wondering if you're doing as well as you are, and you're doing very, very well, and, and, and it, it speaks to maybe the complications of our markets that just buying underlying stocks or whatever, it, 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 there, are, there are new dimensions to it and a, a way to play through all this volatility, but it can get mind-numbingly detailed, can it? It can, but really simple protective strategies are not very complicated. Most online uh, brokers, uh, uh, that's the first thing we, uh, that's taught. It's the first thing that SIBO teaches. How do you insure a portfolio? Any scenario, Neil, that you and I can discuss and anything that's concerning you in the market going forward, there is a strategy to minimize that risk. And they can be very simple. So I'm exposed. I bought an S&P 500 contract that mirrors the S&P 500. And I, I'm suddenly concerned now that my underlying investment is in trouble. I Simply out of the money put buying to insure a portfolio. That's the most simple. All the way to complex strategies using volatility contracts to hedge out that risk. What about the people who have done it? It seems like by the second who are buying and getting in and out of the volatility and of the VIX. How is that? Because it can be so erratic. So the volatility of volatility is very erratic. There's a high volatility to volatility. But if we, even if we put that aside, the uh, dedicated liquidity providers, those participants that are in the market all day long, are pricing that insurance over time. What they're telling you, it's very transparent. They're telling you right now, I'm really, really unsure of what's going to happen. And any of the three to five major uh, uh, global drivers in, in the U.S. market, I don't, I just, I'm really uncertain, I'm really uncomfortable. And the price, therefore, for that insurance of the 500, elevated, more expensive than it would have been almost any point in 2017. When did things pick up? I mean, it was a great success and all, but I, I, I would imagine the, the, the more frenetic the pace and activity, the more interest in a lot of the products that you offer. Um, we've seen certainly over the last 
couple of months, all of that picked up. Yeah, October was a record month for us overall. Uh, February, while it was uh, basically the same 10% correction in the market. That's right. People forget that. They do. Yeah. It happened in a really short period of time. Uh, we really, from the beginning of October through today, have had a very a longer and sustained So what are your markets saying right now? Our markets are saying now that the price that, I'm, that a, a, the market is selling insurance for the 500 is cheaper than what we're realizing in that move each and every day. Let me give you an example. Hmm. If a historic level of volatility is about 17, if we, if we take 16 in this, in this example of, of volatility, that's implying a 1% move in the underlying. Move volatility up to 24, the market's expecting most of the time a 1.5% move in the market. That's a big, big change on expectation. And that's priced into the marketplace, and we see options uh, elevated in their price. But it's also indicative of what for a lot of folks is a scarier market. It is a scarier market. Much more uncertainty, as I say, those big drivers to major change. There's no certainty around any so of them. So how have they played out how to look at what's going on with Brexit, uh, what's going on in France, Germany, the slowdown, China, God only knows. You're, they're all in the category of known unknowns. These are not new. We all know, we know they're out there. But they're so major, uh, potentially disruptive moves to the, to the overall market. That's what the impact is, and that's what we just cannot see through yet. Um, if the government shuts down, there's a way to play that. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I, there's various degrees of shutting down, and, and we're in the early stages. We've yeah, this seen would not be a full government shutdown. Before. Regards, exactly. Right. We've seen that rhetoric before. I really think that the market is as concentrated on uh, really more trade talks, the rate of change of our own interest rates. There are many more macroeconomic drivers that I think we can see through a shutdown. So what's the first thing you look at? Every morning, uh, I look at the, VIX, uh, the, right? the level of VIX and yeah. the level of the futures prices before the U.S. Open. Wow, that's what I'm... All right, Itzeli, the uh, CBA, it, Chairman and CEO, uh, it speaks of our times and the environment we're in that people, uh, you know, I always talk about people get nervous about the markets. There is a way to deal with that. Uh, and the wonderful thing about our markets is there are all sorts of mechanisms with which you can.